Welcome to another episode of Pour and Tell. I'm your host, John, the Cigar Surgeon. Here, as always, with my co-host, Jun Liu. Jun, how's it going, buddy? Jun uh, could be doing better. <laughs> be doing June's better. on antibiotics after a shitty surgery. And it, so and you, no, you probably can't yeah. mix the booze and the antibiotics, hey? No, I, I'm on two different antibiotics. Not to get too detailed, I'm on two different antibiotics in which one of them uh, does not allow me to drink alcohol and coffee oh, for 10 days. Man, the uh, coffee's the rough one. It is. I, uh, I, the other day I was at one of the local coffee shops here and I passed by it. Uh, and I almost walked in just because I, I'm so used to just like drinking coffee. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, and then I was like, Oh wait, you're on antibiotics turn around or else you're going to shit your pants. <laughs> 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 That's always good times. And of course, this is, uh, we're recording this in February. So, uh, to all of our, uh, uh listeners out there that speak other languages, uh, gung si fat soy and, uh, gung hei fat choy. Cause, um, wow. tis, tis, tis the season. And basically for people who don't know what that means, it basically means, I hope you get rich. Yeah. And I can't think of a better new year's blessing than I hope you get rich. I mean, saying you have a happy new year, that's cool. But I hope how you get just stacks and stacks of money. I mean, that's that's from the heart, you know. Yeah, it's like everybody go around saying, "I hope you get really wealthy." Yeah. you're like, "Thanks, thanks." I hope I do as well. <laughs> I also hope this for myself. Thank you, Fred. Um, <laughs> yeah, it makes me laugh. So um, uh, along that vein, uh, I actually just got finished doing a uh, a paired dinner. I'm a member of a local club called the Companions of Quake. And uh, re-upped for another two years, and they did a really cool pairing dinner, where you pair the whiskey, and then the chef, uh, who's from, oh, was he from Hokkaido? Crap! Oh, I for- nice. I forget, but it was there's a distillery there, so he was super stoked because one of the whiskeys is made there. So we were doing the auctions at the end. And uh, chef started bidding on the bottle, so everyone's like, oh, "Okay, well." Uh, chef's bidding now, so no one's going to bid against him because it's kind of <laughs> disrespectful. Um, so he was like, suckers, and he was like, take my whiskey. Um, but it was really cool. The, the food was uh, it's very interesting. It was an Italian-Japanese fusion. Interesting. So I had a Wagyu beef Italian uh, pasta dish, and I got to tell you, man, it was... It was fucking unbelievable. It was just mind bogglingly tasty. Um, and he did like, um, he did like, uh, sushi tacos and yeah, the whole thing was just really cool. Um, and speaking of which, sorry, speaking of Italian yeah. food, um, I'm not sure what it's like exactly in Japan per se, but, uh, so like I have a sibling that lives in Hong Kong and the Cantonese in Hong Kong, they, in in China in general, um, even though the Cantonese are very against calling themselves Chinese, mainland Chinese, which I totally understand. Um, they really love Italian food and they revere Italian food as like upper echelon kind of food. Is it, is it the noodles? Uh, like, is that? Yeah, I think it's everything to do with like the romanticism and like the descriptions of all the pastas, you know, uh, the noodles, of course. Um, and just the way in which everything is described, you know what I mean? Like, and this is, uh, I mean, I could go off a tangent about this, but like, like David Chang, for instance, right? And in which we all know, famous chef, uh, celebrity chef, Momofuku, etc. Guy, he's always trying to say, hey, for Chinese food and Asian food in general, um, it's you know, he wants to elevate it to say, why can we not, you know, have a plate of like dumplings? sell for $25 right. just like the Italians will sell like their dumplings yep. for 25 bucks yep. right uh because in terms of the technique and making it all that it's actually all pretty complex if you want to make like good dumplings for instance um but anyways uh, Italian food is highly revered with the with the Asian countries huh. in general I think that's so. cool I did yeah. not know that no um I mean for, I love I love all food from everywhere so uh you know I can definitely get the love for Italian food so he mm-hmm. essentially did the, the like we did two whiskeys per uh, meal. So it's four courses. Um, 
I mean, it was, yeah. Oh, and then, well, I'll get into the lot. I'm going I'm jumping all around. So, uh, first whiskeys was the, there's some that I hadn't had. The Me Geekio 50th anniversary, um, very light, uh, didn't really strike me as very particularly Japanese whiskey esh. So mm. like, didn't really have the characteristically Japanese flavors that I'm used to. The second one was the Nikka 12, which was good. Again, that kind of was more in the Japanese style of flavor profile. And that was with the, uh, the sushi tacos and good pairing. And then the second one, uh, was the Ichiro Malton Grain World Blend Limited Edition, which I've never had. It was, it was good. Uh, I'm mm. a really big fan of all the stuff that Ichiro is doing. I think he's probably one of my favorite blenders in Japan for whiskey, like just because what he does is so different than everybody else, if that makes sense. And then the second whiskey was the uh, Mizunara Wood Reserve, which was, uh, I've, I've got it, I own it. So, I mean, that tells you how, how much I enjoy it. And what was that pairing? I should, rem- I should really remember this. This is embarrassing. The food was just so good. Anyways, I, one of them was the, was the Wagyu, Wagyu beef pasta, and it was just like blown, bl- mind blowing. And then the uh, last couple of whiskeys was the Miyagikyo no age statement. Which is good. It's it's tough to compare when you got when you own the fifteen and the seventeen. You can definitely tell the differences. To me, this wasn't like the Takatsuru where the Takatsuru no age statement is the pure malt is actually pretty good. Uh Migikyo no age statement, it's not quite the same as the fifteen and seventeen and, and higher up. Uh, still very enjoyable. And then the um the Yoichi no age statement, which uh I think is we'll get into later in the news, but I think I think that's all gone. Um pretty mm. yummy. And then there was a I'm trying to remember the dessert. It was a it was it was an odd oh it was duck duck confit in a ice cream. Oh. Have you had that before? Interesting. Yeah, it was a, it was a, you, yeah. You know, um not to derail you from talking about your Japanese experience, uh, but Aaron and I were uh Aaron of Developing Pilots Ooh. and me, uh we were at TPE. Yeah. <laughs> Who? Ooh. Cigar hater? <laughs> um we were at TPE uh, like a few weeks ago, and uh, the first night they threw a, a multi-vendor event. Nice. And one of the uh, events, it was at uh, uh, Meat Bazaar, which is uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, owned by uh, Jose Andres. I heard about this. Uh, so famous, yeah, famous uh, Spanish chef. And um, he had there a, uh, a foie gras, uh, cotton candy. Okay, so I said I, I said the wrong thing. Duck confit. It was is frog ice cream, not frog. Oh yeah. yeah. So basically, same veins, yeah. except yours is cold yeah. and creamy. Uh, but uh, but same veins, right? Whereas the one that we had there was uh, it was literally a, a little you know stick cotton mm-hmm. candy, but inside the in, in the middle of it is a stick of uh foie gras. Mm-hmm. So, um, that that was a highlight of that meal um I, I felt like it really worked uh it's the sweet that savory umami aspect yeah, of it that was fatty. incredible yeah it was yeah. it was definitely i mean i love trying stuff like that where i'm like I, my at this point i wouldn't even say that's out of my comfort zone it's like you know within my outer bubble but it was a combination of flavors that i hadn't had before and i i mean i jumped right in but you get the fattiness from the ice cream and then the fattiness from the duck uh, and then you get, uh, and their goose, pardon me. And then you get the, um, saltiness from the meat and then you get the sweetness mm. from the ice cream. And it was just, it was just kind of like shock and awe on the palate. And I was like, what is, yeah. what is going on here? Yeah. But and then, and you take, and then you take a few bites and then you kind of like let it linger in your palate yeah. and you're like, shit, that worked. Yeah. And, and right. then they gave us a, a sort of classic creme brulee, but I would say it was more of a Japanese style creme brulee. So it wasn't cloyingly sweet mm. it was more the custard mm. kind of doing the talking yep. and one i've never had before yamazaki 18 you never had yama 18? never had yama 18 oh is john it's good i i think huh it's good oh uh i thought you said just kidding <laughs> um man you and um uh, you and laura's gotta you, you guys gotta come to the bay yeah, i yeah. uh we we uh we would turn up kill yeah turn at my house. All right. So, I mean, it, 
so it's going to sound like I'm trash talking Yamazaki 18, but I just want to preface it by saying I'm not trash talking Yamazaki 18, but it is decidedly not Japanese whiskey. Like everything yeah. about it is like it, I wouldn't even call it a space side. It's like, a, it's like a Highland whiskey that's incredibly spicy and it, it doesn't have any nuance or, or, or subtlety to it. Like most Japanese whiskeys, that being said, it's pretty fucking good. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. It, it, it's it's interesting. Uh, like Yama eighteen is almost like the antithesis of a lot of like current Japanese whiskey out there and with Japanese whiskeys out there, yeah. because there's a boldness of fullness of flavors that sometimes make you think it tips off the balance on your palate, yeah. but it's really fucking good. Really fucking good. <laughs> yeah. 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 And. And and had I had that years ago, I'm sure that I would have had some and picked up a bunch of bottles, and now I'd be laughing on my way to the bank. But sadly, I did not yeah. do that. So, uh, Dude, that was $180 a bottle when I first discovered it, which is about eight years, eight, nine years ago. And I think that's probably, if you could even find it, which I doubt you could. Yeah, if you could find it 1500, now. 1200 uh, 1200 something like that. No, not that much. No? MSRP, if you could find it, it's 400 But Somebody, you could sell it at secondary for... Uh, six to seven. Somebody just tried to convince me to buy a Yami twelve for two hundred fifty bucks, and I was like, "Are you fucking crazy? Uh, fuck I'm that. not paying two hundred fifty bucks for a twelve no, year expression." No way, dude. There's so much, so much amazing other world whiskeys in general out there, like, and especially Scotch and bourbon. Yeah. That there's absolutely no reason for you to spend that kind of money. Speaking of Scotch, a good friend of mine who loves to give me, he's a really good guy, gives me great cigars that I don't deserve and then gives me pours of whiskey that I don't deserve. So this was the uh, Glendronic 1992. It's a 26 year old that's aged fully in Ooh. export pipes, 49.3% ABV. And it's just about the, one of the most delicious things I've ever tasted. It, uh. It's just, I don't know how they managed to put it in a port pipe for 26 years and not be overwhelmed by port. I would say that it must have been a multi refill cask because it's just got mm. that perfect balance of the essence of port without just being whiskey port. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Like, and I had it with a uh, Cuban cigar. I had the, it was the, um, oh gosh, it was the 2018 Propos, the uh, Propios. And mm. uh, gray pairing, gray pairing, because the Propios mm. had this kind of coffee toasted quality to it, which was very surprising for a Cuban. And with that cloying sort of porty, you know, malty, caramelly, oh, man, it was good. It was a, that was a good night. <laughs> I had a good oh, time. Dude, that sounds amazing. <laughs> you know what I get really bummed out about? I mean, I'm in like the San Francisco Bay Area, right? And to my knowledge... There's really no club I could join that you that you've joined in your part in, in Alberta. Um, and it's just we don't really have this. Like we basically have like pop ups here and there, um, but they fill up so fast. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I'm jealous. Maybe you need to start a, you know, start your own, start your own companions, the quake or whatever, man. Because like, Dude. there's got to be like minded people out there. The Bay Area is certainly big enough. Yeah, for sure. So what do you got? What do you got going on? I mean, you you kind of been off um, the wagon, but I'm sure before you were on the wagon, you had a pint or two or whiskey or two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about a, a scotch uh, and a couple of bourbons. Um, so uh, scotch wise, I I uh, picked up a couple of bottles of the Lafroig uh, Cardenas, um, the 2019 bottling. I eat the most recent bottling. Uh, so this bottling, uh, if you guys are interested, you guys should be able to find it. Um, I know it came in at the tail end of 2019. Uh, and for instance, California just recently started getting it. So um, this is a, a Isla whiskey, um, 119 proof, uh, 59.5 ABV. Um, it was just, it, it was, it's really good. I mean, I, I like Lafroig in general. Um, and if you like Isla whiskey, uh, there's really no reason that you shouldn't try this. Um, you know, of course, you're going to get the, the the herbal kind of medicinal kind of uh, like a sea brightness, saline kind of a thing going on. Um, but also, this one had a ton 
of like this sugary like strawberry thing going on. It was like this smoky cherry stuff going on. Um, like a lot of fruit sweetness. Um, and I thought it was, you know, like medium, medium, full body. Um, and what I really love and uh, particularly great whiskey is having a really nice oily mouthfeel. Mm. Um, and I just I, I love that about this bottle. Um, you know, and I'm glad that uh, I was able to be, get lucky and pick up a couple of them. So, um, so definitely go pick that up if you guys can. Uh, a couple other whiskeys I've had. Uh, on the bourbon side. Um, so I went back to uh, uh, Hard Water, uh, which is one of the more of an American whiskey bourbon bar in San Francisco. Um, I had a, uh, uh, from Buffalo Trace, a Weller Antique 107, uh, 107 meaning the actual proof, which is why they call it that. But it was Hard Water's uh, store pick. Um, I, I love this. I mean, this was $11 for a proper ounce and a half pour. Um, so very approachable and affordable. Um, you know, it, this is what quintessential, uh, in my opinion, bourbon should be. You know, this is vanilla. This is, um, it, it's creamy, a lot of vanilla, a lot of caramel. Um, you know, that, of course, with bourbon, you get a heavier influence in oak, being new charred oak. Um, fantastic. Uh, another one that I had, there's a distillery called uh, Willet. Um, so Willet yeah, yeah. is, yeah, so Willet is starting to um, kind of have more bottlings of their own distillate at this point because, you know, their age ha has kind of crept up to like that six to nine year mark now. Uh, so at Hard Water, I had their uh, six year old pick. Uh, so their barrel pick. Um, you know, I must be missing the bandwagon because uh, I know a ton of people like Willet uh, distilled bourbon. But, you know, this one was, uh, I'm just not impressed. I mean, it was corny. It was way too bright. Uh, it was very alcohol forward, which that aspect of it, I, honestly, it immediately turns me off. Like, um, if, if I get something on the nose and palate that is alcohol forward, mm -hmm. Uh, I immediately get turned down by it because it is difficult for me to like weave around and like find flavors of the whiskey. Uh, and this was exactly that. Um, you know, I, I'm glad that I was able to try it at a bar um, and not actually buy any. I mean, it's kind of hard to buy any of this stuff anyways. Um, and I'm still not impressed. I mean, it's uh, and it's kind of a shame that, you know, uh, that I don't like it, but more for other people. Huh. Cool man, that sounds like a that sounds like a good lineup. Kind of walking all around the park on the on the whiskey front. That's always fun. I need to get you know what I you know what we you know what we got to get into you and me both, What's John. Um, I think we need to go revisit uh, other spirits out there, like the rums and like I'm thinking about getting into like Armagnac and that kind of thing. So you know, because we talk about whiskey a lot. That's no problem because I have you know a small ocean of rum to go with all the different spirits i've got some interesting uh tequilas and yeah definitely all right hey. news news we got a lot of news because some of this stuff was stored up before the christmas season um so i'll just kind of hop in and this kind of links to the japanese stuff i was talking about earlier we, we've kind of known that the japanese whiskey it's one of those things where everyone's kind of on the Japanese whiskey train. Of course, Japan doesn't produce even a fraction of the amount of whiskey that they would need to, to meet demand. And so all the old stuff, all the 21s and the thirties and all that, it's, it's just been snapped up everywhere. And the, uh, I think the recent cancellations have been all Yoichi age statement. And I think that includes the no age statement. And then they were going to focus on Takatsuru, but now Takatsuru has been uh, eliminated entirely. So even the pure malt is going to be gone. There's going to be a no age statement Takatsuru that's coming out, but it's not the pure malt. And then the uh, Hikushu 12 is gone. The Hibiki 17 is gone. The Nika 12 is gone. And even, even the uh, coffee grain and the coffee malt from Nika, which I didn't think was really that big of a production, all gone all discontinued uh so yeah it you know i uh 
you know, this this is sadity news. To, and, and this is especially sad because, you know, unlike bourbon in which, you know, your sweet spot can really be within, you know, bottle and bonds, five plus years in which you get a really good bourbon product. But within Japanese, case, you know, higher, higher age. Yep. Um, and I mean, in current day landscape, it's so freaking expensive that you can't really find it or buy it, even uh, with an MSRP. Um, if you can find an MSRP, um, <laughs> I'm not surprised by it. I'm just really bummed that you know the next wave of good age stated, older age stated Japanese whiskeys, we're not going to be able to truly enjoy for many years to come, decade plus. I don't know. Um, and that's in, and I hope once the production ramps up again, that there's still enough of a demand for whiskey lovers out there, uh, to continue to, you know, the demand and, uh, have a simple supply of it. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm happy that there's a lot of good, there's a lot of whiskey fans out there. Uh, but I'm very dissatisfied of not being able to like taste this shit anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's just it, right? So, I, you know, I think because obviously I have probably an absurd amount of whiskey now. And that's kind of how I feel about it is that I'm, I'm approaching some of these bottles. Like I go to a tasting and, you know, when's the next time I'm going to be able to buy this? Or when's the next time I'm going to be able to taste this? Like if I don't pick up a bottle and three years goes by, is that product completely off the market? Like is, oh. you know, is it, I tasted a 17 is, is the oldest now that they produce a 15 or a 12. And just, just some love, uh, that story came to us via the spiritsbusiness.com. They've actually got some really great articles on there. Uh, obviously, that one particularly sad. So what are you going to do? Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, I think there, there's still really good whiskey out there. You know, they're getting ever so increasingly pricey, uh, especially in the U.S. where the new tariffs came, right? So... Um, I know a lot of the vendors out there, especially big box stores, are they bought a bunch of stock uh, anticipating the tariff increase. So I don't really see it come out with the elevator pricing yet, but it will be soon. Uh, but that's one thing. And it's another thing to also say, all right, guys, you really don't need FOMO for bourbon because shit, man, like every single year throughout the year, these bourbon producers, American whiskey, let's say producers are still coming out with like good whiskey yeah. right that's going to be aged 10 years or whatever there's plenty of fucking stock out there so you don't need to get fomo honestly yeah, they're, you really don't they're they're i mean they're they're definitely producing at a, at a substantial amount of volume there's no like i know i read last summer that they were talking about like oh you know the bourbon the bourbon shortage is coming it's like dude are you kidding me right now like no don't worry there's a they're producing enough spirit yeah, these the major distilleries are spending multi-millions or sometimes hundreds you know multi multi-millions yeah. to hundreds of millions to uh update their distillery and increase yeah. production right it's going to be there there's going to be good plentiful healthy stock um but Maybe i think uh, gotta let you stop know, letting these rack houses uh burn to the ground and pour hundreds of thousands of gallons into the rivers for god's <laughs> sakes stop yeah, it work at rick houses stop it you know. crazy people uh, next article I thought was kind of cool. This comes via the National Post. Um, I've, I've read something similar to this before. This is, this is to do with accurately dating Scotch whiskey because I think what, what you run into is in sort of in the vein of whiskey disappearing, this old stock being very hard to come by, then there's a secondary issue of are you buying a genuine older whiskey? And even if you have a really good sense of the bottle and the cork and all of the things that go into that it's still possible for you to get scammed by a, f a fake whiskey so gordon cook and his team they basically used a combination of uh, anthropogenic radiocarbon so for, for the people who aren't aware there's essentially a i guess you'd call it like a delineation point between the point at which we started using atomic weapons and atomic testing and after we started using atomic testing, so much so that you can test essentially everything organic for radioactive and radiocarbon signals. So that tells you whether 
this particular thing was around or manufactured after, say, I think it's 1948 and then 1960 something, 1961, something like that. And I know they've done they've done it in wine before. This is the first I've heard of them doing it in whiskey. And then I guess they did sort of a calibration of radiocarbon dating based on other factors because some of the distillers were sitting on barley stock. And so, you know, you, it kind of throws the thing off because maybe they're sitting on barley stock that was five years old or maybe they're sitting on spear from another distillery before they, they did, did the complete, uh, you know, vatting. So they kind of did a combination of radiocarbon dating and then I think they, they also said that Gordon created this biblical knowledge, whatever, of all these different barley so they can actually tell you, you know, yeah, this comes from barley that was produced between 1930 and 1940. So it's very likely to be uh, accurate that this whiskey came from, you know, the 1930s or whatever. So, yeah. And it, the article said like about half of them are actually fakes out there <laughs> with this well, carbon dating. I mean, you think about it, the, the likelihood that you can find uh, preserved and in good condition, 60 or older whiskey I mean, and you think about the money that's involved. I mean, the last time I heard of a Macallan 50 going, I think it was like $300,000 US or something like that, or $275,000 US. So a 60 or 70 year old whiskey, it's, that's, that's worth enough money for somebody to pull a scam. Hmm? And I, I mean, think, yeah. I, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please. No, I, you know, where there's money, there will be scammers. Yeah. Right. Uh, especially within consumables, such as, Whiskey, wine, cigars as well, right? Uh, we've seen uh, many even reputable auction sites uh, in which fake Cuban cigars that are well-aged um, are fakes, right? It's, it's true. It, it's, if you want to play in this field, you should know that. Um, I will say you should trust your sources but with something that's so dated, such as these whiskeys, sources could get easily lost, right? Like who originally procured it, um, where it's been, how it's aged, how many times it has changed hands, yep. right? Who changed their hands initially? All of that is really not documented within a lot of this stuff, right? They're on auction sites. Yep. So, you know, in, in one aspect, I always say within if you're a wine lover, if you're a spirits lover, cigar lover, you know, you, you have to trust your sources. Like 100% you have to trust your cigar sources. Even with that said, me personally, I've been duped on the Cuban cigar side, right? Um, this was maybe seven, eight years ago in which I purchased uh, fake uh, Monte Cristo Grand Reservas without knowing that, right? That's rough. But the crazy thing about this shit is like the actual packaging, right? And this parlays to whiskey of course as well um you know the cigar box that the 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 cuban warranty seal the date it, it all checks out right but the actual cigars once you smoke them we're like okay what the fuck right this is probably a bunch of black banana leaves rolled up um and i guess you know with that said like how many people are actually gonna smoke or drink these very old well-aged you know uh spirits or or cigars um probably that many a lot of these guys i think buy these to essentially have it as a uh, a piece yeah right? it's to a show, show it's a show piece right yeah um and you know if you want to be in that and show that status and never open it and enjoy it hey man great that centerpiece of this 1926 mccallum looks amazing on your shelf okay but i'm not that person i want to drink it i want to smoke it uh -huh. um so i guess really you know trust your sources uh consume it and even if it's fake or not if you enjoy it be happy with it right uh but you need to be fully aware of knowing the playing field you're in <laughs> yeah oh yeah That's... and i mean <clears throat> this is why I jump at the opportunity to go to an ancient malt or old malt tasting because again, mm -hmm. you know, I know that the bottles that are being poured are legitimate and I'm getting to try a whiskey that the shelf value might be several thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars. So for me, 
there's been times where I've had a whiskey and it was like, well, that was the last pour from that bottle. Uh, and there may only be three bottles left in the entire world. So, you know, the mm-hmm. likelihood of me ever even seeing another bottle of that is zero. Right. So, you know, that's, but that's, you tried it, which is yeah. the most amazing part, right? You yeah. like for guys like you and me, we want to experience these crafts, right? We want to consume these crafts. Um, and that's what makes us happy. Yeah. Uh, so, I think the best way to approach all this stuff, man, is I don't care if you think a $40 bottle of scotch is the best thing in the world or if you think a $1,500 bottle of scotch is the best thing in the world. Like, to the extent you enjoy it, be happy. Although it's probably, better it, if it it's probably better if it's the $40 bottle. Well, yeah. 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 Go, 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 <laughs> go get yourself a bottle of Glendronic 12. There you go, like, man. It's over here, stuff. you get it for $36 at Costco, Glen- right? Glendronic 18, it's, it's only yeah. like 120 bucks or whatever. It's cheap. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so to close out the uh, wonderful show with a little bit of negativity, uh, let me just first say, fuck InBev. Um, I, I don't. I mean, I've been dancing around it for a while here on the show. I'm really not a fan of their practices. I think, you know, I was thinking about this the other day because we talk about, you know, what's the difference in cigar industry between craft and not. And there was a quote I was reading about one of the other brewers in Calgary, and he says. You, you cease becoming a you cease being a craft brewery the moment where you stop putting the beer first and start focusing on profits and I was like you know that's really for me what is the line between what is a craft cigar manufacturer and not is like you're not worried about tobacco anymore you're worried about making money and profit and there's nothing wrong with that it's just mm-hmm. you really can't call yourself craft um and all of that sort of leads to the story which is a local brewery which i was a really big fan of banded peak got bought out by labats uh and labats is owned by imbev so you know it's really disappointing i mean good for yeah. the owner because he's you know make his nut but um i don't i don't see myself drinking their beer again yeah and it's it's you know uh talking to multiple breweries and and, and beer brand owners and brewers, oh. you having a most vast majority of breweries out there, they're not in it to make money. No. So in the event that you're able to get to the level in which you're able to sell to one of these, you know, big companies, um, I, I that's fantastic. And, and we rain, and we almost beat the subject to the death, but <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy for that particular brewery. Um but keep true to the craft of what you're doing, right? And make money because the craft of it, you know, will allow you to continuously increase your profits. Um, or the other flip side of it, which actually absolutely works, is market the shit out of it and people are going to buy. <laughs> yeah. Right? So pick one or the other, right? I, I just... The thing about InBev that really annoys the both of us is uh, when they buy out, let's say other breweries, uh, their focus is to kill that brewery. Yeah, it's not. It's not like um, you know people people bag on uh, Suntory, and they say, well, you know, Suntory owns all these uh, drink companies. They own a bunch of ja- uh, Scotch uh, whiskey distilleries. Mm-hmm. Yeah but they bought them to make sure that they stayed afloat and they had enough money to, to continue to do the thing that they do best. They didn't yes. come in to shut them down or change the way that they did business. Like you said, InBev's coming in, you know, in a large case, they've done it in the, across the United States to shut down these, these um, quote-unquote larger, medium-sized craft breweries. Yeah, I mean, and, and after Centuri acquired Beam, like... When have you seen since that happened, uh, Suntory products uh, degrade in, in quality or bean products degrade in quality? Quite the opposite, right? Like Suntory has to go to NAS because it's inventory thing, right? It's a supply issue. Yeah, the demand um, is so high they're, for the product that they have to go to no age statement. Right. Whereas like on the beam side of things, there's been multiple uh, bourbons and rice that beam has come out with since the acquisition that are just flat out fantastic. And they're opening up more ways for stores to uh, continuously do store picks, right? And, and fantastic store picks and barrel picks, right? So that model I follow, I completely drive with 
that's great. You got greater funding, uh, increased production, and keep the craft. But Embev is exact opposite. Is they buy you and say, no, we're going to kill this brand so that we could continuously shove fucking piss water down other people's throats. The main populace. So, so basically, what June is saying is, drink craft and uh, support your local your, your local yeah. craft manufacturer. There's certainly plenty of them available. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, that's it for us this week on Developing Palace. Thanks so much for checking out. We got some emails while we we're on a little bit of a hiatus there. Thanks for reaching out. We appreciate the love, and we'll be back as always in two weeks. Uh, keep your questions coming.